Hi guys, I'm uh, I'm Stephen Hawley. I'm here to bring you the first question. Uh, is cursing a sin? I personally believe that it is. Um, in the Bible, in Ephesians 4:29, it says, "Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful, so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them." And this is the first part that I base my belief off. The second part is based off of integrity. What we do in <clears throat> oh, sorry about that. What we do in and out of church. And um, integrity is doing the right thing when no one is watching you. And it defines what a person will do in a situation where their core values are truly tested. It's about, <laughs> it's about living the lifestyle of salvation. And it begins with the small things. And then God begins to trust us more and more and provides us with more and more opportunities to glorify him. And as long as we hold true to integrity and to our values, right and wrong is shown in the end, and it answers our question of whether or not cursing is a sin. Uh, furthermore, in James 3, 9 through 12, it says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water, there's, there's a second part to that. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring, my brothers and sisters? Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Just as the verse said, we are not called to give both a blessing and a curse with the same mouth. It's just like a stream that is fresh. You can't really bring salt water through it. So, um, and yes, they are words. Sure, they can be used. And I mean, heck, when we stub our toe, let's, that's one of the most painful things in the world. Sometimes you just let it slip. But, um, however, it's all a part of integrity, all a part of integrity, all a part of fig trees. So you can sub in words, you can do a little dance, but tonight I challenge you, try and go a week without uh, cursing. Instead, try and shower blessing on people instead. That's all I got for you tonight. Thank you guys for listening to me. Here comes Chesney. All right, thank you, sir. He's awesome. All right, so the next question, we're going to go straight to that, is why doesn't God let animals talk? <laughs> and the reason that this um, question was asked was there was a, uh, in, an instance in the Bible when uh, a couple of animals did talk, but obviously you guys have not seen, uh, been to Disney World, right, with Mickey and Goofy and Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse. I think those are all animals anyway. Numbers uh, 22, way back in the, in the Old Testament, there was a, a story about a man named Balaam. Balaam was a prophet, if you don't know, and, uh, but his, his heart was kind of shady. He was a little bit rebellious, and the king was also evil, and the king was afraid of God's people, the Israelites. And so the king wanted Balaam, because he was a prophet, to curse the people. But Balaam knew that he shouldn't do that because God would get him. But God was still a little sketchy about how, how Balaam would approach the king and what he would say. And so on his way to see the king, God caused the donkey that he was riding on to stop in his tracks. Because God had placed an angel in front of the donkey that Balaam couldn't see. So the donkey, of course, is afraid and he stops and he won't move. Balaam starts beating the donkey with a stick, which, by the way, I would totally call PETA on Balaam the the angel appears twice more and twice more Balaam beats the donkey finally on the third beating Balaam's donkey opens his mouth and says dude why are you beating me and Balaam according to scripture is not all that surprised I don't know why but he's not and he starts arguing with the donkey And then finally, God allows Balaam to see the angel. And he knows he better say what God 
has told him to say. And so he goes and he does that. So that's what this question was referencing. And of course, there's only one other instance I can think of in the Bible where an animal speaks, and that's kind of the snake in the garden. But of course, he was disguised as who? The devil, right? So this is the reason that I think animals don't talk anymore. Um, God has given us a, an even better gift to speak to us every day. There's actually two. One is in black and white, and you may have one on your shelf at home or on your desk or under bed or under your bed or I don't know where it may be. It's called your Bible. But the second gift that God has given us in order that we may know what it is that he wants us to do instead of having to have our pets talk to us, that would be the Holy Spirit. And this is what Jesus says before he was getting ready to go back to heaven. He says this in John 14, 26. He says, but the helper who is the who... Whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And then Jesus goes on to say in John 16 and 13, he says this, but when he, the who? Come on, who? Thank you, comes. He will guide you into all what? Truth. The spirit of truth guides us into all truth. And so I believe... This is why God says that's not even needed. You have the Holy Spirit to help you. Of course, back then they didn't have the whole Bible put all together. The Holy Spirit had not yet ascended to earth. And so we have these wonderful gifts. And I believe that's why maybe that's not necessary. Question number three. Why do people kill to create change? Good question. Why do people kill to create change. Now, I wasn't sure if this was a question about war or just like random violence, so I'm going to kind of look at both of these really quickly, okay? Uh, I want to start with war here because I think sometimes that's a big question uh, for people in our day and time. And Ecclesiastes 3 is where I want to start with this. I think Brandon used the scripture reference um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and so I want to use it again here. And I'm just going to read verse 1 and verse 8. And it says this, For everything there is a season... A time for every activity under heaven. A time for what? And a time for what? So at times, everything is permissible that God sees fit. Sometimes, people can't be talked out of their evil, because there is evil in the world. Do you know that? There is evil in the world, and sometimes people can't be talked down from their evil. Sometimes, unfortunately... War has to take place in order to keep you safe, in order to keep our country safe. God did mandate war many times throughout the Old Testament and he even aided in war. And so you can go back and read about some of those stories, especially with King David and all those kind of people. But now malice murder is kind of a different thing. Would you agree? People that just randomly kill because they hate or because they disagree or whatever it is, that is not what God uh, wants for his people. That is not what God wants. And so that's why in Exodus 20 he talks about do not murder, do not kill. And so that is not mandated by God. So sometimes um, killing, unfortunately, uh, for reasons when there's no other way to protect, war may be uh, permissible, but other times... Um, I don't believe it should be unless your life is in danger. All right, number four, moving along. If I have sinned, will God accept me? This is a great question. And sometimes we feel differently than what we believe. Would you agree with that? Sometimes you believe something, you know God's Word says something, but you don't feel that way. And so I think maybe this is where this comes from. 1 John 1, 9, this is a verse you need to write down, at least the, the, where it's found. This is one that I memorized probably when I was about your age. And it says this, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, He is what? Faithful and He's what? To do what? Forgive. Forgive. Does that mean you? Yes. It means all of us. So the answer is yes, but here's the thing. 
God loves you too much to leave you the way you are. He will forgive you for anything, but he loves you way too much to leave you the way you are. And so he wants you to follow whatever it is that his word says about the situations that maybe you may be facing. And he's made a way out. He's made a way for us to live above, that, above sin, and he desires for us to do that. So I think that's pretty plain and simple. All right, number five. Some of these I, I'm not taking a lot of time on, and some I'll take a little bit more time on. This is one that I want to take a little bit more time on, and it's this. How can I reconnect to God? Now, this question makes me think that the person that asked this maybe felt, there's that word feel again, but maybe felt at one time they were close to God, and maybe now they feel like they're not. And maybe that's the case, and maybe it's not. Maybe it's just the way you feel, and it's not reality. And so we have to navigate that. But maybe let's just say, for this question's sake, this is a person that was really close to God doing the things that they knew were, were right, and now they're not, and they want to reconnect. Again, I want to go back and say that by faith, it's how we do these, reconnecting with God, not, fe not by the way we feel. Your feelings will lie to you so many times, over and over. I just don't feel close to God. I don't feel God anymore. There's going to be times you can be closer to God than you've ever been before and not feel like you're close to Him. And that's okay. You know what that is? That's your faith being built. That's you growing. You know, when we first ask Christ into our life, everything is so great. It's unicorns, you know, and magic, and it feels so good, and our faith is really high. And then life kind of sets in, and things start to happen. Problems start to happen again. And then all of a sudden, we're like, wait a minute. I asked Jesus into my heart. Life is supposed to be perfect. But is it perfect when you ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life? No, you've just got somebody to walk with you now, right? You've got the creator of the universe helping you navigate through life. And that's the point. This is what James 4 and 8 says. This is another good one just to jot down. You can do it really fast. Because your connection back with God starts with Jesus. And God says this, or, or James says this, Come close to God, and God will come what? If you come close to God, God promises that he will come close to you. Now, I want to say this. Sin will also disconnect you from God. So if there's sin in your life that you need to confess, that's a good way to get back on track with God. You're never going to get past that until you confess it. You're never going to feel like you are reconnecting to God or actually reconnect to God until you begin to confess the things in your life that maybe God is talking to you about. So here's what I feel like are the things that reconnect you to God. And it sounds like things that you've learned since you were a little kid in kids' church, okay? But this is true. Reading your Bible, praying, going to church, confessing your sin. Those are the things that reconnect you to God. Going to church, reading the Bible, praying, and confessing your sins. Those are the things, again, that reconnect you back to God. Why? Because that helps you come close to God, and then God in turn does what? Comes close to you. All right, question number six. Here we go. Does God love the devil? Does God love the devil? What do you guys think? Just yes or no? Okay. It's a tricky one. Uh, so I'm going to give my opinion. Okay. I don't know, honestly, for sure what the, the perfect answer is for this, but I'm going to give you my opinion. Uh, just real simply, um, I don't think he does. Here's... here's what I base that on. The heart of Satan is fixed in his hatred to God. Therefore, the judgment for the devil is fixed. It's already been made. 
We can read in Revelation 20, 1 through 2, and it says this. This is God's fixed plan for the devil. There's no hope for him, okay? It says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding his hand, the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, which is the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the what? That's his fate, and that's how it's sealed. Now, Jesus does tell us in Matthew 5 that we should love our enemies. I'm sure you guys have heard that. That's true. But I believe that that verse is um, for the relationships here on earth, the interpersonal relationships that we have with one another in order to help us to live at peace with one another, in order that everybody may go to heaven and everybody uh, may see God's love in us even if they are enemies. So since Satan embodies everything that God is not and everything that's opposite God, I don't think God would do something that he would not ask us to do. So does God want us to love the devil? I don't think so. So again, my, the, where, I le, where I leave it is I don't think God would ask us to do anything or do anything that he wouldn't want us to do. So that, that's my opinion. Number seven. If God is loving then why will you be sent to hell if you don't go to church or read the Bible? Now, at first I kind of laughed at this one, but um, I really think somebody may be wondering, is this, is this real? And I want to just put your mind at ease that nowhere in God's Word does it say, if you don't read the Bible or go to church, you're going to hell. It just doesn't say that, okay? Um, I don't think it's going to help you if you don't do those things, but let's talk about this. Some people think that God's up in heaven with his evil plan laugh. Give me your best evil plan laugh. Thank you. He's up there going, hey, there's Jake again, messing up. Bzz, zap. I, mean, I know, it's always you, Jake, I know. But I just think God is not, he's not like that, okay? He's not just waiting Please mess up so I can zap you. In fact, 2 Peter 3.9 says this. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness. And this is talking about the second coming of Christ. But is patient towards you, not wishing that any should what? But that all should reach what? Now, do people go to hell? Yes, they do. If people don't choose the safety line that God has thrown out to them, if people don't choose Jesus Christ as the Lord and the Savior of their life, if people continue in their life of sin, then that is why people perish. Because John 3.16, the verse that many of us know, is the one that tells us how not to do that. And it says it like this, God loved the world so much that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him will not what? But have eternal life. So it's not not reading your Bible and not going to church that sends you to hell. It's not having Jesus as Lord of your life. That is the key to heaven. If someone were a follower of Christ and found themselves stranded on a desert island without a Bible and without a church and they died and they were following Christ to the best of their ability by themselves on this one island, and they died, do you think they would go to heaven or hell? I think so too. So, now here's the thing. However, church and the Bible are key. Remember we talked about reconnecting, connecting with God? They are key to helping you stay on the right path. In fact, Psalm 119.11, this is another good memory verse, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not, what, sin against you. So how do we keep from sinning? We put God's word in. The second verse that I want to share with you is about church or coming together. And it says, and let us not, let, I'm sorry, and let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works. Look at this. Not staying away from our worship meetings. 
as some habitually do, but encouraging each other. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. So, God's Word tells us that we should read our Bible. We should meet together. This is how it keeps you on path and keeps you on track with what it is that God wants you to do. Number eight. I'm excited about this one because I'm going to have you write some stuff down. So get your pens ready. Ready? How do we get rid of habits and tendencies in our life? The person went on to say it's really, really hard. And I know that it is. Okay? Here we go. I want you to write this down. Habits are not broken. Write, it, write this down. Habits are not broken. Period. They are replaced. Period. Habits are not broken. Period. They are replaced. You can't muster up enough willpower to get rid of a habit that you want to stop. If you're cursing, if you're um, smoking, if you're, you know, whatever it is, looking at things online you shouldn't be looking at, whatever that is, if there's a habit that you biting your nails, whatever it is, you can't break it, you have to replace it. I'm going to give you three words to help you replace a habit. You ready? Write this down. The first one is decide. Decide. Decide that you're going to do it. Draw a line in the sand and say, from this day forward, I have decided I'm going to do my best to get rid of this habit. I'm going to do my best to replace it. The second D word I want you to write down is declare. So decide and then declare. What does that mean? Tell somebody. Tell someone, this is my habit. I want to get rid of it. I'm telling you because I've decided, and the best thing to show that I've decided to do this is to tell you. And the third D word I want you to write down is double up. Double up. What does that mean? That means ask for accountability. Talk to a godly person, a Christian that you trust. Maybe it's the same person you tell. Maybe it's not. But you say, ask me questions about this. Ask me, am I biting my nails? Ask me what I've done to replace it. Ask me, am I still cursing? Every time you hear me say a cuss word, I need something that punishes me. I need some kind of accountability. I need you to tell me, hey, I see you doing this. And give them permission to help you. It's accountability. And I promise you, if you'll stay the course over time, these habits will fade. So if you have a habit, you need to do these three things. Decide, declare, and double up. Number nine, do pets go to heaven? I hope so, but I don't know. Maybe. There's a verse in Scripture in, uh, I believe, Revelation 5, where Revelation 5 talks about the lion and the lamb laying down together in heaven, and we've all probably heard this before. But really, this is just a metaphor for the two uh, attributes of Jesus, that he is the conqueror, he's the lion, and that he's the lamb of peace that brings salvation, the perfect sacrifice. And so really, this is a symbol but here's a thought, an idea, okay? Again, this is kind of my opinion. In Revelation 21, God talks about the new heaven and the new earth that's going to be rolled out in the future for those of us that are followers of Christ after Jesus comes back to earth. If you remember back in Adam and Eve's time, there was a garden. It was perfect before they sinned. And I believe that this is the atmosphere, the environment that God wants to roll out again in Revelation 21, this perfect environment that we can live in, this new heaven, this new earth, as God intended for Adam and Eve to live in the beginning, except they messed it up when they sinned. And so I think that were there animals in the Garden of Eden? Did Adam have animals that he named and tended to? 
Yes. And so possibly I might see my little schnoodle Sadie running around in the new heaven and the new earth. I don't know. I think that would be kind of cool. Number 10. Why didn't God just start over when Adam and Eve messed up? Good question. When Adam and Eve sinned, of course, he cast them out of the Garden of Eden. But if you go, he kind of did start over. If you go on down in Genesis 6, there's a man there called Noah. You remember Noah. He and his family were the only people that God found favor with all over the earth. And so he said, Noah, take two of every kind, build this huge ark, put them in. And I'm going to destroy the world, except for you guys. And so God did kind of start over there. But here's the thing. If he keeps starting over, eventually I think he's just going to throw his hands up and go, there's no hope. But he did give us hope. And that was Jesus Christ. And so God made a way for us to have a relationship with him. And let me ask you a question. I want everybody to look at me right here. If you had a son and somebody said to you, if you were to give up this son, then everybody in the entire world would be cured of cancer. What kind of decision would you make? Now here's the thing. If you decided to do that, and everyone was cured of cancer that had it, but there were some that chose not to take it, wouldn't that hurt your heart? I mean, wouldn't that make you still want to be more patient and more patient and more patient, hoping that eventually they would come to the cure? And that's what God is doing. He's being patient with us, just like in the verse we read a while ago, so that some would come to repentance from him. Last question. Number 11. Why do you have to believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven? Again, I'm a follower of Christ. I believe that the Bible is the truth. I don't think it's a truth. I don't think it's an opinion. I think it's the truth. And so I base this, the answer to this question, found in a verse, John 14, 6. Again, another great memory verse. And it says this. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. I almost want to drop the mic and just walk away on that one. But I want you guys to know tonight that you're not the only one with questions. And I'm so glad and so proud of you that so many of you have brought questions to church. Because we want to make sure that church and youth group is the safest place that you can bring questions and ask them. And I want you to know that questions about Jesus and the Bible didn't just start here or in the, in the recent uh, years. In fact, if you go back in Scripture, there's a man named Nicodemus who was a very, very, very important person, a very important Jewish leader. And he had heard about Jesus doing miracles, and he was like, man, this guy must be the Son of God. But he was kind of scared to go ask questions in front of people because of his position. And so the Bible says at night, Nicodemus went and found Jesus, and he began to talk to him. And Jesus told him that he couldn't inherit the kingdom of God unless he be born again. Now, you think some of your questions were dumb? Nicodemus asked Jesus this question. How can a grown man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? This was his question. He was a smart dude. And all of a sudden, he's got this really dumb question. It appears to us. But you know what? Jesus didn't laugh at him. He didn't correct him and say, you've got to be so stupid. No, he tells him this in John 3 and 37, or 3, 3 through 7. He says, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and spirit. He says, no, Nicodemus, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. And you should not be surprised by my saying you must be born again. Some of you may be here tonight as we close. You may be here tonight thinking, you know what? 
Jesse, I want to know more about what you're talking about. I don't understand it. I don't understand what a relationship with God looks like. I kind of even feel like Nicodemus. I don't really know what all this means. But I want to tell you tonight that Jesus is here saying you can be born again. What does that mean? New life put inside of you, eternal life. And tonight you can know about that. So I want you to take out your connection card. I want you to turn it over. And if that's you tonight, you just mark that box. I'm not going to make you come up front. not going to make you uh, raise your hand. not going to make you do any of those things. Just mark that box that says, you know what, tonight I do want to become a follower of Jesus. I want to figure out what this is about. I'm going to make that decision, and when you pray, I'm going to pray with you. Tonight, maybe there's some of you here that say, you know what, I need to make some steps in my faith. In order to grow, I need to obey and maybe you haven't been baptized. We had some people be baptized this morning. It was so cool. Brandon and Chris was rebaptized, and it was just a neat thing of saying, "Today, I'm showing the world that I'm committed to Christ." Some of you have done that. You know that experience, and it's helped you to grow in your faith. You don't even understand it, but because you took, you're obedient in that step. Because Jesus does ask us to do that. Because you are obedient, you've grown in your faith. And maybe you need to take that step. And all you have to do is just mark it on your card. We'll send you some information. And thirdly, I think this is a really good next step. I know we've used it a couple of times in this series. But some of you need to start reading your Bible. If it's on your phone, if it's on an app, dig it out from under your bed and start reading Find a Bible you can understand and read for yourself. Ask God to help you see what it is that you need to see. He'll show you by Spirit. He'll show you. Mark that on your card. I want to be praying with you this week if you mark that step. I want you to stand where you are after you mark your steps on your card. and just You can just stand right there at your seat. I'm going to pray for you.